Hey, this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm so excited because we have one of our team members, our podcast team members today, to talk to you today about storytelling. She is an expert in the field, and she has her own podcast on our channel, and she talks about legacy writing, storytelling, how to write books. She really gets really, she dives deep into the art of it, and it's so exciting. Today, she's going to talk about the power of storytelling and how to get started. But before we begin, I just want to give her a quick shout out to the Happy Wellness Expo. They are having an expo in Livingston, New Jersey. People are coming from all over the nation to be a part of this um, expo. And it's a great expo. They're going to have over 100 exhibitors. And it's all about doctors, coaches, people that are interested in health are going to be there. They'll be giving out free products. They'll have technologies you can try. It's great. It's exciting. And there's going to be a lot of great things offered at this expo. I'm going to put all the information in our description box. So if you're interested, and if you want to become a part of it, the number's there. Give them a call. They're looking for people to participate and they want people from all over to come visit because there's so many things to share. So give it a, a look, see if it's interesting to you and try it out. Give them a call. All righty. So Rebecca, I am so excited to have you on the show today. This is amazing. I, you know, I love storytelling. You know, I, that is one of the things I base my career on when I, when I do speaking events, I storytell. And even when I'm on, I'm doing summits or I'm anywhere I, that I am with a group of people and I'm trying to make an impact in their lives, I storytell. And it's such a popular topic nowadays. But the thing is, not everybody knows how to do it. It. It's something, it's an art. It's a form that needs to be developed, needs to be practiced. And a lot of people don't know how to do it. They don't know how to get started. And I know you have some amazing tips to tell people how to get started. And you have some great tips on how they can evolve from, from step one to step 100. And they can make themselves an amazing storyteller and get through to so many people just by sharing their own experiences and their own story. So take it away, Rebecca. Tell everybody a little about yourself before you begin in case they haven't seen your previous podcast. She has several podcasts already that are on our, on our, our, our show and also on her podcast show. So check them out. But tell everybody a little about yourself. Okay. Um, I've been writing since I was 10. And a teacher told me that with my imagination, he'd see me in books. So I believed him. And that was, it became my dream goal. That was what I wanted to do. I have done that. I still do that. But now I want to help others who want to tell their stories, who want to write them down, who just want to be able to share them with others. And that's the key to storytelling. You have to be comfortable with your own story. Right. Um, I often tell this story of um, when I was five and a half, we were camping in a park, a state park in Northern Michigan. And I had gone over after breakfast and you could smell the, the smell of, of bacon that had been grilled all through the park. Everybody must have had bacon that morning because you could mm. smell it everywhere. Mm. And then you got the the wood smoke from the wood fires. Um, it was kind of uh, a crisp morning, but it was nice for late August. Mm -hmm. And I'd gone over to the playground, which was not far away and at that time in the world nobody really worried if their kids were out of sight for a little bit right and some of the, one of the older kids or two of the older kids had brought over wax papered um from bread wrappers because back in the 50s and 60s bread came in wax paper not in plastic right and you take the wax paper and they had a slide and it was metal and take the wax paper on this metal and you run it up and down and it makes the slide go faster. Okay, So there were probably 10 kids there working with wax paper on this because they tore the wax paper into pieces. And then the, the older kids were up at the higher part and 
those of us who were younger were down lower waxing this slide. And then we picked up all the paper and put it in the trash bin and we were sliding. No big deal. My aunt and my brother, who was two and a half, came over to get me because we were going into Gaylord, Michigan to see family, um, do some shopping, and then come back out to the lake. Well, mom and dad were still getting things tied up over at the campsite, and my younger sister was with them. And my brother decided he wanted to go down the slide. Well, the slide was 10 feet tall. I mean, it was a huge slide. And he went up it, and I went up behind him, and he sat down and he looked at it, and he got scared. Now, my aunt was about 15, maybe. Mm -hmm. And she said, just give him a push. Being five and a half, I bring back my arms and I shove, right? Yeah. That's what giving a push means. He stiffened on the way down. And her plan had been to get there and catch him when he got to the bottom. She didn't know we'd wax the slide. No one asked me if we'd wax the slide. Mm -hmm. She didn't get there. And he hit the bottom and he's all stiff. Mm -hmm. And he broke his leg in two places. Ooh. My mom heard him scream, grabbed my sister and went running. Dad finished up with what he was doing and brought the car around and he moved the bench seat all the way back. Yeah. Cause he knew somebody was going to be riding in the front seat. Well, mom got there. She handed off my sister to my aunt and she went to see my brother. She did not move him. She was afraid if she moved him, she would only hurry more. Right. Dad got there, got around him and picked him up so he was not on the broken side of his leg. Right. And said, everybody in the car. So my aunt and I get in the back seat. And she's holding my youngest sister, youngest at the time. Right. And mom gets in the front seat. Dad gets in the driver's side because he's got the seat way back. He says, I'll adjust the seat in a minute, guys. Slides my brother across so his head is in mom's lap and his yeah. feet are on dad's. And they slowly moved the seat up so as to not jar him and drove in to town to the local hospital. Well, at that time, the local hospital wasn't really much more than an ER. Right. Um, they maybe had 50 beds. It was a small hospital. Yeah. They x-rayed my brother's leg. And then they wrapped it in an ace bandage and taped it to the other leg. Oh, wow. And said, you have two options. You can go to Traverse City or you can go to Hurley Medical Center in Flint. My dad says, we live in Flint. We'll go to Hurley. We drive back out to the campground, let the rangers know what has happened and that dad will be back up on the weekend to pack up everything and he'll be checking out a week early. We drove back. Back then, there was no expressway to get to where we were. Mm -hmm. And every little bump in the road, and my brother cried. Aww. And it was a good two-hour drive back. Mm -hmm. And so dad's maintaining speed, and he's trying not to hit any bumps in the road. Um, couldn't miss them all. I mean, there are some that were just there you didn't see. Right. 
And it was, they weren't potholes or anything like that. It was just normal bumps in the road. Right. So he dropped mom and my brother off at the hospital, Mm -hmm. pulled into ER and slipped my brother off his lap and went in and said, I need a gurney. I have broken legs out here. And at that point, they knew it was one leg, but and they knew it was two breaks, but they didn't know how bad it would be if it would require surgery. What? Um, no surgery was required. My brother was in a cast on his right leg, and all you could see were his toes, and on his left leg, just below the knee. And um, he had the world's first skateboard. It was body sized. Mm-hmm. For a two and a half year old, um, my grandfather made it, put a piece of carpet on it, and put wheels on it so that my brother could wheel himself around in the house. Right, and mom wouldn't always have to carry him. Um, and he laid on it and used his hands, and he got all the way around the house. If we were out in the yard, they put blankets in the wheelbarrow and pillows all around it and then put my brother in it so that he could be outside with everybody else and not stuck in the house. Wow. That's pretty amazing. Now go ahead. It was, it was amazing. My aunt took the blame for it and I was sick for two nights in a row. And the third night, my dad finally said, what is bothering you? What's making you sick? And I broke down. It was my fault. And dad explained to me that no, it wasn't. It was an accident. And that no one was to blame. Not even my aunt. So then I was fine. But it took two days, two nights of being up all night with me being sick to my stomach. Because I was upset. Right. That's a pretty Um, amazing story. No, no ill effects as far as my brother grew to be six foot tall. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, They had said at one time they thought maybe he would need an inch lift for the one shoe, but that didn't happen. He's never had an issue with it. Um. That's pretty amazing. It was just a childhood accident. And I don't remember how many years, two or three after that accident happened, that the slide disappeared. Wow. And they got all new um, playground equipment and the slides were all plastic. You know, you you told that story really great. Now- What's your your um your your suggestions for people who want to tell a story like that, who want to really capture people's you know attention? Uh, storytelling is great, but so many people have a hard time sharing their stories, or they they leave parts out, or they don't know how to condense it. And what's your your suggestions if you want to be a good storyteller? What are what are some things that people have to um, realize if they want to get started? You know, I started storytelling um, years ago, and I memorized a little story in a book. I don't even know who wrote the story, mm-hmm. but what, it was in a book of stories that my parents had, and. It was about a teeny tiny woman who lived in a teeny tiny house. And one day she went for a teeny tiny walk and she found a teeny tiny teapot. And all she needed was the lid. So she took the lid. And she went home. No, she took the whole teapot. And she took it home and she cleaned it up and you know, made tea and everything else and went to bed that night. And she hears a voice 
saying, give me my teapot. Mm -hmm. After she gets into bed and she's been asleep and she kind of pulls the covers up a little bit, but mm -hmm. she figures it's a dream and it'll go away. Well, that's all well and good, but she goes back to sleep and the voice gets a little louder saying, give me my teapot. Right. Until the point where she's got her head all covered up and it shouts at her, give me my teapot. And she pulls the blankets down and she says, take it. And there's, there's a big build up to that. Yeah. Um, I skimmed over it just to give you the highlights, but I thought it was a great story. And I learned to tell it to my brother and sisters because I have two younger sisters now. Um, and I did for years. Mm -hmm. And it was just, I would read it to them to begin with. And I got to the point where the words were repetitive enough that I just memorized them. Right. And just told it. And yeah. somebody, um, after I started teaching, learned that I could tell stories and asked me to come to a Girl Scout campion and tell stories. And that was the first one I told. Um, I don't remember how many others I told. It was just something I did to entertain my siblings. Right. And it's kind of go back and find a simple story and learn to tell it. Mm -hmm. Read it until you know it well enough that you can tell it. And you use hand gestures, facial expressions, different tones for different speakers. Um, you don't have to change your voice much. Just use a different tone. Yeah. You know, for someone who's angry, use an angry voice. Mm -hmm. As opposed to someone who's not angry. And it just so happened the person whose teapot was taken was <laughs> angry. Right. You know, it starts out as this little teeny tiny voice, but it becomes this very angry voice until this little woman finally says, take it. Right. If it's yours, take it, you know. Yeah. And then she can roll over and go to sleep in peace. But it, it's just, it's something you have to practice. Yeah. Um, you don't ever just get to tell a story. Um, don't ask me to come on stage and say, okay, this is your topic. I need you to tell a story on it. It isn't going to happen. Right. Um, I need to prepare whatever story I'm telling and, and I have, I said one time, if I ever wrote my memoir, it would be in little snippets of things that happened in my life. This story about my brother. I tell the story about my aunt when I was two and a half. Right. And my grandparents were adding on to their house and they added a basement is what right. they did. So they lifted up the house and dug out and added this basement and garage. Mm -hmm. And we were down visiting and Rosemary was going to take me on a piggyback ride. And I said, can we take one of your dolls? And she said, yes, but if you even mess up one hair on its head, you never get to touch my dolls again. Mm -hmm. And I believed her. So I've got the doll under one arm and my other arm around Rosemary's neck and we're going piggyback riding. And she decides she's going up to the kitchen, right. which means she's got to go up an aluminum ladder yeah, to get to the kitchen from where we were. She did that. And being a kid, she was about 12. She um, tripped on the top ring. Wow. Top rung of the steps. My grandfather was sitting so he could see out the door and he saw her fall. And he knew one or both of us was going to get hurt. And so he's up and out the door 
before either one of us landed. Rosie scraped up her knees big time on the cement back porch. Me, I clung to the doll so as to not hurt her. Right. Because that's what I've been told I couldn't do. And I hit a metal pail on the way down, which probably saved a lot of injury. Um, but before they could get to me, and I have a calcium deposit, which is why I have bangs on that side of my face, um, because I have a big knot there left from this calcium deposit. Mm -hmm. Did it do any damage? No, it shot out. My dad threatened to buy me a football helmet because every time I turned around, I was smacking that side of my head <laughs> for months. He said I had black eyes for probably two months just from that. And, uh, but no, it, it was not a big deal. Um, you know, I survived just like my brother did. My right. mom told Rosemary that my sisters could not be around her when they were two and a half. Mm -hmm. And they weren't. <laughs> I mean, they were, but they weren't in any place where they could get hurt or anything. Right. Uh, and Rosemary was extremely careful around them because she did not want them hurt. Right. Um, two of us had already been hurt and she felt responsible. She wasn't. She didn't do anything that made it her fault. Right. They were both accidents. But, you know, those are little snippets that I could put in a memoir. Right. Along with the teacher telling me that with my imagination, he'd see me in books. Hmm. That's That covers, you know, two to ten right there. Right. And each one's a little tiny two, three paragraphs. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not, it's not elaborate. It's not anything, but that's the way I would write my memoirs in the little things that happened in my life. Right. Um, but as storytelling goes, I have a friend who is a living storyteller. She has done Sojourner Truth. She has done... Um, Oh, I can't think of her name. <laughs> the lady who sat on the bus. I know what you're talking about, but I can't think of the name either. Yeah. she uh, Rosa Parks. She died just recently. Oh, well, like within the last couple of years. Right. Um, But um, Betty Jewel Slater has brought all these people to life. I mean, mm -hmm. she dresses in character. And she tells their story, but she tells their story in relation to whatever point she's trying to make. Right. Not only does she get their story out there, but she also makes a very valid point for what she wants to talk about. Right. And she's excellent at doing this. Yes. She's worked at it all her life. And she says, at this point, there are too many black women for her to be able to do all of them. Mm -hmm. And so she has to pick and choose. Right. But that's what people do with their, with their lives. If you have a business, how in the world did you get to be in this business? Think about it. Is this what your dream job was? Yeah. And if it wasn't, what changed to make this your career? Right. I mean, people fall into jobs all the time, but they don't necessarily make them a career. Right. They make them their own they put their own twist on it. Mm -hmm. The business story needs to be everybody in that business, their story too. 
Right. This is how the owner got to be where he is. And this is how he makes me feel or she makes me feel a part of the team. Right. And when you have a team out there selling your business as well as your product or service, right. mm -hmm. that's free advertising. Right. Why would you not use it? Yeah, exactly. But getting started, if it's something you want to be able to tell your grandchildren, how do you want to tell it to them? Mm -hmm. What is it you want to get across? When I actually wrote the story about my brother, I talked about the smells from breakfast mm -hmm. and the wood burning in the fires, the, the coals that were still there from the night before. Right. Um, that I, I could hear the lake. I could yes. hear the laps, you know, as, as the, the waves hit the shore yes. from where I was. Right. Um, and then it was all sandy around the playground. It was like a, a one big sandbox. Right. So that, you know, if we did fall, we were falling in sand, not likely to get right. hurt badly. Um, but it's just one of those things that, you know, I ended up coming down the slide the same way I went up on right. the ladder because to slide down it. I would have just slammed into my brother and hurt him more. Right. Not going to happen at that point. Um, so, yeah, it's it's what you you grow up with and, and how you feel about it. And, you know, what was cool in your childhood and what wasn't. You know, you, what mistakes did you make? Right. In getting to where you are. What did you learn from those mistakes? Right. I learned it probably would have been better to sit down and slide down with my brother. Right. Rather than to push him, I should have just slid down with him. We were both fit. It wasn't like, you know, there wasn't room for us. Right. We were just little kids at that point. Yeah. Uh, so we just didn't do it. And that's, that's a shame because he got hurt. But in the long run, you know, I learned a lesson. My aunt learned a lesson. Right. And we all learned about waxing slides. Mm -hmm. Something I hadn't even known about until that morning. Yeah. Or what they would do. And I had been up and down the slide three or four times since it had been waxed. Right. So. I knew what was going to happen. I just didn't know that he was going to get all stiff. And <clears throat> that's what it is. Um, so it seems like you took, you know, events in your life that were meaningful and you yeah. turned them into stories and you did, you, you told them in a way that would capture the audience's attention, but at the same time, you help them also learn from these stories as well. So it seems yeah. like storytelling, is, you know, it's it has a purpose. It's not just, you know, you can you can you can tell a story to entertain, but you could also tell a story that's meaningful and teach the audience about something. Because it seems like if you have one little aspect of that story you could relate to, you can connect with the person that's telling the story. And it seems like lots of amazing things could happen from that, whether it's building a relationship, whether it's, you know, creating a future client, whether it's helping someone to change their life because they learned something from your story. It's like, there's many things that could happen by learning how to tell a good story. It seems. There are tons of things that can happen from telling a good story. There are tons of things that can happen from telling a story where it isn't a happy ending mm -hmm. where something happened that had repercussions and what did you learn as a result? Right. Um, yeah. There are just, there are bad things that happen. 
I mean, th there are tons of stories in everybody's life where we've made mistakes because we do that. We're human. So if someone but wants to use that as a career and, and let's say they, they have a hard time sharing some stories because you know, that those stories, maybe they didn't have a happy ending or they, they caused the person, you know, pain along the way because they were obstacles they were enduring. How, yes. does the, how does a storyteller, how does a person get over the humps of being able to feel comfortable telling the story? Because if, if the story is kind of painful because it had events in its, in that person's life that caused them, you know, hardships, but if they use that story, they could help others. What are your suggestions that they can, how they can be able to learn how to tell that story and not be affected by the emotions that they, that are stirred up along the way? Um, you know, it's practice. It's, it's being able to be honest with yourself mm -hmm. and, and then practice telling it, start by telling it in front of a mirror. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, can you do it? Mm -hmm. Does does your voice catch at certain parts? That's okay. Because that's the human thing. Right. And people can relate to that. Um, I have a friend who um, wrote a book because work got to the point where it was stressing him out. Yeah. Um, things at home were falling apart because he was so stressed out and he had to take a step back. Yeah. And he wrote about mental health in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And his book came out um, last year. I don't remember the name of it right now. I could look, but I, I don't have it um handy but when he was telling us in our mastermind group about you know then he had to go out and speak to people about it right and it still at times causes him to catch um he was asking for feedback on you know how his presentation went and I said, I had to thank him for writing the book. Right. And they said, come up here. Why? I said, because I'm a person who suffers from seasonal affective disorder, mm -hmm. which means in the winter months from, say, mid-October through mid-April, I would get extremely depressed. And there was not a whole lot I could do about it. Because where I lived, there wasn't a lot of sunshine during right. those months. Um, I lived in northern Michigan, and the sun just didn't shine. November was really gray. December got a little better, but not grand. And by yeah. January, I was so depressed it didn't matter. Um, I just, all I could say was, give me spring break the end of March. And, and let me go somewhere and, you know, and you can't just take a vacation when you want to, when you're teaching. Right. That doesn't work. Yeah. You know, and people say, well, you got three months in the summer off. I said, yeah, but those are not the three months when I suffer depression. Right. And I took medication for it, which helped, but it doesn't cure it. It's still gray and dark and it's still there. Yeah. Um, and I said, I have to thank you because no one considers this. And I know it. I've lived it for years. Right. And he said, and I said, you know, I, I just appreciate that someone has written about it. Mm-hmm. And he says, and for that, you get a hug <laughs> because, you know, he could relate to what I was saying. And yet he could see people in the group who are relating 
to what I was seeing, saying. And it's not easy for me to talk about having seasonal affective disorder. It's part Mm -hmm. of the reason I moved south. Right. I get sun. In fact, the sun is shining today, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, and here it is February. Right. Um, it's, it's very rare for me to have more than ground cover snow. And most of my snow pictures are at night because by the time I get up in the morning, it's gone. Yeah. (laughs) And that's, even if I'm up by eight o'clock, most of it's melted away. Yeah. Um, or is in the process of melting away this year, we had six inches for like three days right? or four days. That that's amazing. Um, I don't get that. And as much as I like the fresh snow and to see it, it's beautiful. I don't want it all the time. Yeah. And I don't want the cold temperatures that go with it. Right. So, um, you know, it's, it's what happens to you and how you can make the best of it. Yes. I was always the one that we had to quit sledding early because I had to go sit in the car and get warm. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I couldn't do it. And it didn't matter how many layers of clothing I had on. Right. I couldn't stay warm. Mm-hmm. Now, if you had to take all these things that you talked about and, and give some people some takeaways, what would you like to emphasize? Because you've told a lot of stories today and you've also given a lot of great tips. You've given us examples about how storytelling should be told. You showed us different examples of, you know, how it should be done. Now, if you had to sum all that up and maybe give some good takeaways, what would you like to tell the listeners who want to get started in storytelling and the things that you feel are the most important? I think, If you really want to get started in storytelling, whether it's your story or it's something that you want to tell your grandchildren that you've read in a book that you think is great for them, learn it, read it, read it until you are so sick of it. You don't ever want to hear it again. You don't read it out loud, read it silently to the point where you know it well and you can sit and tell them. Mm -hmm. Um, I knew a lady who did that. She did that with Kipling's The Jungle Book. Yeah. And I had never heard this story. And I was about 11, 12 years old, something like that. And we were staying in their home. They moved into a little cottage they had behind the house. Yeah. And it had rained for days. And she came up and said, I'd like the children to come back. And if you don't mind, I want to serve them some warm cookies and milk. I just made a batch. Mm -hmm. And my folks said, well, yeah, if you don't mind. She said, sure, give us about an hour and then come on back and, and you can join us. She wanted to give us a break from our parents and our parents a break from us. And she sat us down and she had us look out this big window into a forest behind their house and said, I want you to pretend it's a jungle. (laughs) And she told the story of the jungle book, Mm -hmm. which I had never heard before at that time. And it was amazing. I have the just so stories somewhere in my house. Right. um, On a bookshelf or in a box somewhere here. Because that story made such a big impression on me then. And when Disney finally got a hold of it, (laughs) you know, I was in my late teens, early 20s. And so I was well aware of the story and what would happen. Yeah. Um, But Disney brought it to life as far as that goes. But I could look out in that woman's backyard, imagine the jungle, and I could see it happening. Mm -hmm. 
And she kept us spellbound for close to an hour telling this story. It's just find the right story. Find something from your childhood that you enjoyed hearing. Right. Practice it. Tell your children. Tell your grandchildren. Tell the neighbor kids. Mm -hmm. Tell anybody who will listen that thinks it's that you think might like it. Right. Um, that's where you start. And then if you're telling a story of your life, tell it as if it's happening right now. Right. Put yourself in that setting. How did it feel? How did it look? How did it smell? Mm -hmm. That's when you can write it down. When you can write the smells, the sounds, the feel, the feel of the sand between my toes right. as I was running across it to go up the slide. I was barefoot. <laughs> my mom had shoes and socks in the car for me. I didn't have them on at that point. She also had a towel that I could brush the sand off my feet. So when I put on the socks, I wouldn't have sand between my toes. <laughs> I mean, mom was prepared for everything. Mm. Um, but it was one of those things where I had to put myself back there in time. Right. To be able to write it down. Exactly. Once I wrote it down, I can tell it. Every now and then, my voice will choke. Right. Um. It doesn't always anymore, but every once in a while, depending on what's going on in my life, it will cause me to choke um, when I get to the part where he broke his leg right. and where he cried at every bump in the road. I will never forget that. Yeah. He may not remember it, but I will never forget it. Exactly. Exactly. That's an amazing um, story. It's one of those things where, you know, when you take the blame for something mm -hmm. um, and internalize it, you live with it. Yeah, very true. And people do that every single day. Yeah. But what people don't realize is that you could heal yourself, get over the hump, and then you could actually share those stories to help others who are going through similar situations or going through anything in that story. And the, just a little piece, like we were saying before, could actually help somebody overcome something in their life and move forward in life and give them the, 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 the courage and the hope and the strength they need so they can have a healthy and, and productive life. Now, you have services that you offer. Can you tell people the different things that you do and how you help others? Oh, I have a, a bunch of services I offer. I have a, a strategic coaching plan. It's a, a $97 two hour class in where we look at your ideas and we look at what you're looking at to how, what it is you want to tell. And it, it may not even be a personal thing. It may be, you want to tell a story, write a novel, write a short story even. Yeah. Um, and we look at it and we set guidelines and, and go for that. And we work on it for two hours. And I say, if you need to come back to me, let me know and we will work on it. But I do. And, and I will do this in a group. Um, if you have five to 10 people who want to do this, you know, hit me up. Um, it, it would be 97 a piece. And this is what we do for two hours. And we work in groups and talk about every, everybody would get a chance to tell their idea. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, I'm offering a storytelling course um, in March. Um, I have two days set for it. I have a morning one. Um, I'm planning to do that right now on Zoom. Um, and it's, it's a two hour from 11 to one on the 12th of March. And then I have a two hour from seven to nine on the 14th. So that if people are working and can't get to it, 
there's, you know, an alternative. Um, they're both, they're $103 because mm-hmm. the state of Kentucky says I have to charge sales tax, mm-hmm. which makes me crazy, but I don't want them, you know, they're not there to be, let's break the bank. Right. They're there to let's get started, but my knowledge is worth something. Exactly. And so is my time. And I don't think $103 or $97 for the other course is all that. It's very inexpensive, actually. It's really, it's it's well worth the money, especially with your knowledge and experience. There are people that don't even have your knowledge and experience that charge a lot more so what you're charging is pennies compared to what other people and you're giving so much more to to the people that take the course. So yes, your your courses are well worth it for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Now, now, where can people find your books also? Um they're all on Amazon or they can go to my website which is my name rebeccavigas.com and it's rebecca r e b e c k a and Vigus is V as in Victor, I-G-U-S. And it's they're all on there. They're on my um, book pages. The newest one and my Let's Write Fiction book are on the homepage. Um, but you can find them all on the books page. And there are, what did I figure out this morning? I think there are 16 of them on the book page. Excellent. There are 17 books altogether. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. And do you have any uh, social networks that you people can find you on or should they go directly to your website? Facebook. I am there. I don't sell the books from there. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's just Rebecca Vigas on Facebook. Or they can find me at Rebecca Vigas, the writer whisperer which is my book page where I can tell you, you know, what events are coming up, what books are being featured, um, what courses are being offered. They're all on that page. Um, And then I do LinkedIn. I have a YouTube channel that I need to revamp, Mm -hmm. but there are a lot of, videos on there about writing so feel free um, excellent use those excellent this has been amazing thank you so much rebecca for coming on the show today you've really shared a world of knowledge i've enjoyed your stories i love the way you tell stories i think you provided really great um information on how to get started and I'm sure people can contact you on your website also, probably, if they want to learn how to yes. get started, if they have questions. Yeah, there's or anything. a contact site. Um, and, y- you know, you can set up a, a 30 or 60 minute consult. They're free. So it doesn't matter which one you choose. Mm-hmm. Um, just don't choose the Coffee Connect because that's not that's in my virtual world and mm-hmm. that's a whole nother thing you don't want to deal with right now. Uh, um, oh my gosh. This has been great, Rebecca. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I've, I've had an amazing time talking to you. Like always you provided a great amount of knowledge and everybody remember that Rebecca is on our team. She is one of our community podcasts players and she has her own podcast and check it out she has all her podcasts listed and you'll really enjoy them because she she hits a lot of different topics that I really can help you enhance your writing career so thank you so much Rebecca for coming on the show this has been wonderful thank you I've enjoyed it you have a great day you too bye now bye bye <laughs>